So welcome everybody today. This is an incredible pleasure to be presenting to you the first person to my knowledge who graduated as an undergraduate from AUP and came back after she finished her dissertation to take her mentor's place in the International Economics Department. It's a beautiful generational story. They're still very close. I talked to him yesterday. He's traveling today or he would be here to hear, to hear Maria speak. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. And not only is it a generational story backward in the direction of, of Maria's mentors, but also forward because we have Nikki Hartman on the call today and Diana Hickox, who are both uh, 2020 graduates and students of, um, of Maria, and they're going to be part of the conversation today as well. It's great to see. I see Silver, I see Sarah, I see Pamela Spurden, I see Mohammed, I see Petra, and I thought I saw Jasmine who just disappeared, but I think she's here. Um, great to see all of you today. So at AUP, Maria, and I should say that she had really an illustrious educational trajectory after studying international economics at AUP and applied mathematics. She went on to do a master's of science in development economics at SOAS in uh, London, and then a PhD in international political economy at King's College London. She went beyond a PhD for a postgraduate certificate in higher education from the London School of Economics and Political Science as well. Uh, at AUP, Maria teaches courses on economic history, on development economics, and she's going to say a little bit more about what that is. In economics, there are sort of two different directions you can choose to go in. One is a very theoretical direction. The other uh, seems to be, at least from where I sit, more connected to the world, its issues, its problems, our goals, and Maria cho chose that path. She um, is also, so at AUP, she teaches a whole range of different courses within the department, but she also teaches first year students in our first bridge program, a course on the invention of money, debt and tax, which instructs first year students about the history of economics and how money, debt and tax may or may not keep our society together. And I wanna say that Maria just won an award, an international award, and I wanna get it right. So let me just find the name of it here. She won the History of Economic Society Joseph Dorfman Best Dissertation Prize in her field for 2020. So Maria, we're going to start today with um, a first question. And I'm going to send you a couple of questions, but you should feel free to elaborate, talk to your students, um, you know, interrupt, whatever. We're, we're improvising. So first, tell us your AUP story. What was the path to Paris? Why did, what did you find when you first arrived? What was it like to be a student in 2008, which was a moment of, as I remember, a moment of transition for the world. It was, I'll never forget it. Actually, it was my first year as president when you came. Um, and we both experienced together the, the huge global financial crisis that hit that year. Um, so tell us a little bit about that particular moment in your journey to AUP. Yeah, thank you, Celeste, for such a kind introduction. And thank you for having me. I'm really honored that you asked me to be a part of this. So my, my AUP story, um, I, uh, I'm Swedish, but I was raised in England. So I decided that I was going to study in Sweden. I got into Lund University in the South, and I just didn't like it. I liked the material I was being taught. I liked the professors, but I wasn't I didn't fit in amongst my classmates. I just clearly wasn't Swedish enough. And so I Googled American universities in Europe because I wasn't quite comfortable enough or had the money really to go outside of Europe. So I just fell across AUP's website. And I mean, the rest is really history. I arrive at FIAT my first day at AUP, which is where we used to do orientation. And five guys stand up and say, can I help you with your suitcase? And I mean, you know, how, how can you not like it, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, but in, in all seriousness, I think I, I, I fit in at AUP straight away. And I know one of my really good friends is actually online with us today, Suzanne Spahn. I met her a week after coming to Paris. And, you know, we were so close that we would arrive to place, if I'd arrived to a place alone, people would go, where is Suzanne? <laughs> it's not normal that you're alone. So it just, I found this group of friends instantly. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, I sat in on my first economics course or my first two economics courses over that year, which you rightfully pointed out, Celeste, it was a, um, you know, it was a time when the world was experiencing one of its biggest economic crises. Um, AUP was also not going through such a um, calm moment. You became president. I remember my first semester there, 
the president actually left and, and you took over. Um, so it was a time of, I was very, very confused in my economics classes, what was going on. Um, I was very um, worried about the fact that my student loans coming from Sweden were losing value. And so of course my economics classes came alive because of the context around me, but also because of the professors that I had. I know Sharam Alijani taught me macroeconomics. And then I had my principles of microeconomics with Ali Ranema, who you um, mentioned already. This is this is my mentor um, in at AUP, right? And um, he is really the reason I went on to um, do my masters at, at SOAS, go on to um, do my PhD um, in international political economy. And you know, as a side note, uh, in Ranema's class, I met my now husband and father to my child, which is a huge side note. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that, that's really my um, AUP story. So AUP family and little Anton, who was born this year, is class of 2034, something like that, right? We have it all, we have it all planned out. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about Ali, because I do think that intellectually, he sort of opened some doors for you and helped you make choices within the field itself. Maybe you want to sort of transition, talk a little bit about Ali, but also then lead us to development economics. What does that mean? Uh, what are the sorts of questions that are asked within the field of development economics? Absolutely, yeah. So, so I mean, Ali Ali Ranema was was my mentor through throughout AUP and 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 still is today. And he um, he is someone that someone that most students will will know who he is if he you know if, you, if you're at AUP. Um, and you're connected to the economics department at all, you'll, you'll know who he is. And if, if you're lucky enough that he takes you under um, his wings, um, he will just um, open up a whole new world um, to you and, 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 and support you. I mean, I think he has more um, confidence in me than I have, um, than I have myself. Um, he has always um, just thought that I would succeed before I even thought it was possible myself. I remember getting into a master's at LSE and, and going to tell him in his office in Grinnell and him going, well, of course you did, but you're not going to go there. You're going to go to SOAS instead because it's better. <laughs> and I, I know, of course, I, I followed his advice and I was very happy to do so. And I can go on a little bit later about why that was a good choice and so on. Um, and then, you know, he, um, so I took his principles class with him and then I, um, and then I went on, on, on to take his development economics course. And that's when he approached me to say, why did why um, would you like to be my TA for my principal's classes? And that's really the experience that got me here today. That's when I realized that, wow, I really enjoy teaching and I really enjoy teaching young adults economics and, and, and because that just gives us such an, a vision of what the world is and how we could make it better, um, understand our history, etc. cetera. Um, and um, this is this little um, you know, anecdote about Ali and, and the fact that he's my mentor. I remember meeting up with him the beginning of my PhD, and I said, um, I said to him, you know, um, it'd be really great if I could be a professor at AUP one day. Um, this is, you know, why I'm doing this uh, this PhD to be a professor. And he just turns to Pierre, my my now husband, and says, uh, Maria the bulldozer. <laughs> I don't think I've ever gotten such a great compliment, compliment before or after. Um, and so it's really just been a, a great relationship with Tuna too enough, and he's always. Respected, to, um, respected me, listened to me, but also pushed me to, to go further. And I mean, his, um, his course in development economics, anyone who's done that course with him, and he taught it for some um, 20 years, if, if not more, um, it changes the way you see the world. You, you realize that economics is much, much bigger than the mainstream, um, than, than the core courses you do in economics, which is on mainstream economics. And you realize that there are parts of the world and, and you know, that covers more than half of the world's population that, that cannot use the mainstream economic models to understand its history, to understand its political system, um, because they've been colonized, um, because they just clearly have different histories and different contexts, um, religions, etc. And, and that you learn in his development economics class. And that is actually then why, you know, he recommended that I go to SOAS, which is um, famously a has famously has a heterodox economics department. So it's um, the professors there are um, they all look at schools of economic thought that are that are not part of the mainstream that are that are actively um, marginalized really in economics uh, I think um, so do you want to describe 
you want to describe your thesis? Because I, I love the idea that you're a Swedish person who went to school in England, then went to college in Paris, but actually wrote on Indian economics. Why did you write on Indian economics? What was it about Indian? I mean, not that it is, it's a global explorer story, obviously, but you were compelled probably by a couple of great development economists who were Indian and who asked really pertinent questions about things that traditional models didn't include. So do you want to tell us a little bit about why you made the choice you did and what you studied, what you wrote about in your thesis? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it is. I get asked this a lot. Why, why do you look at um, in India? Because it is in in economics, obviously, in development economics, it's not so rare. In history of economics, which is what I do, and I'll go on to talk about what that is, it is very rare, in fact. Um, so at EUP, I got really interested in development economics, and I and I got interested in India just because it has a very interesting history. It has, you know, it used to be some two, three hundred years ago, it used to be a very a dominant force in the global economic, in the global economy, and then and then slowly. Um, kind of deteriorated because of lots of different factors such as such as colonization. So in my thesis at AUP, I looked at uh, microfinance, which is a big um, uh, kind of micro level policy, um, giving micro loans to, to poor people in especially Bangladesh, but also in, in India. And, and so it so as I then realized that actually, what I was taught by Ali Ranema at AUP was that you know, there are certain theories that come up in certain moments in history and, and, and in certain regions. And it's really interesting to figure out why they come up in those contexts. And then we use them, you know, we have a lot of path dependency in economics, right? Once we get one model, we, use, we keep using that, but we forget then where, the, where it was initially um, invented, kind of conceptualized. And so I got really fascinated by how India fit into history of economics. And then when I um, ended up at King's College London, where I did my PhD, um, I realized that that had been written a lot on already, but what hadn't been written a lot on was uh, um, a group of Indian economists in the late 19th century who are essentially the first modern Indian economists. To come out, they were educated at imperial universities in India. So they were ed educated in a very um, British European um, curriculum. But then as happens, you know, with like, that happens a lot with, um, you know, you have you have students as uh, you, as as students, right? You you then learn the skills to critique your teachers, right? And that's exactly what they ended up doing. They said, "Look, none of the oh no, that's an exaggeration." But the the classical political economy that was dominant at the time, they said that doesn't explain India. You know, Europe is not colonized like India is. Um, we need our own economics, and so they came up with this term, Indian economics, and that's where really what I've looked at in my in my thesis, I. I look at um, these Indian economists and how they figure out what development is to them, to their context. And it's really using knowledge and how, um, using the knowledge that existed already to adapt it to their context. And this is why I asked you to title this talk, you know, how economic ideas shape our world, because that's what they were doing. They were taking ideas that they were taught about Europe and but in with the umbrella of saying this is the world, but they're saying no, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. We need to change these ideas and adapt them to our context, and that obviously then went on to change the way um, India um, developed afterwards. And a lot of a lot of studies um, in later periods show that actually some of these ideas that um, were conceptualized by these early Indian economists. Um, were very much a part of the first government um, after independence, et cetera. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think was interesting is that part of your academic trajectory, you worked with Mary Morgan from LSE. Mary Morgan's groundbreaking work is about how economics came to rely more and more on mathematical models. So, um, what it i guess what you i guess what that means is that we quantify things that the rest of us think are not quantifiable econ economists do why don't you tell us a little bit about um her work on how the un quantifies development and inequalities and about the millennial goals the millennium uh, sustainable development goals and how your work was influenced also by her yeah i um I, during my PhD, I taught economic history at LSE um, and, and just happened to, to hear that this Mary Morgan was working on figuring out how the UN measures development. And because my research was on, on development, um, 
even though the period was not the same as in my PhD, she decided that, oh, well, you're a good person to, to, to help me with this. Um, <laughs> so I got, I was kind of in the right place at the right time. And she's, um, as you said, she's, she's quite very well known in history of economics, even though we're a very small field. Um, of course, also, which is a, as a side note, she's also a woman. So she was one of the first women in the field to come um, up and, and, and be well known. So for me, it was but, uh, particularly good also to have a female um, role model, which isn't that easy to have in, in economics. Um, and so she, she, she was embarking on this project of, okay, so the UN uh, measures development in order to decide whether the policies that the countries are implementing are leading to you know better lives essentially right and but we're as you said economists are obsessed with quantifying and often quantifying things that we other people don't really want to quantify you know think about the covid situation at the moment um there was a lot of talk about this if we need to slow down the economy then we're not going to make as much money but yes but lives matter right and and there are economists right now trying to figure out how to you know and put value on lives even more than they were before pre-COVID, you know? And so the UN then um, uses, you know, we, we came up with this idea of gross domestic product, right, which measures the whole economy in the, around the 1930s. It was especially done in, in the US. Um, national accounting had been done before, but it really became very dominant in the 1930s. And then towards the kind of late um, 20th century, yeah, like 1980s, there was this big, um, um, Indian economist Amrita Sen, who said, "Like this, just does not explain what a good life is. What, what you know, if if we're just measuring money, um, production, etc., that's not actually telling us whether people are better off. It's more about whether they have the ability to, um, you know, do they have equal opportunities? Do they have the ability to access a good life?" Right? And so he talks about how literacy, um, education, um, if, if you don't have that, then, then you can't access, you know, the GDP growth. You can't access a job. You can't get a job if you're not, if you're not literate, for example. And so he came up with this um, index called the Human Development Index, which most of you may have heard about here, because it has really been able to become quite a dominant figure in, um, in global economic circles. And um, that includes then GDP growth, but also um, years of schooling and life expectancy, which has its own criticisms and so on. And that's what we try to do in, um, in that research I do with Mary Morgan is try to understand, okay, so how did they move from then um, measuring the economy from, you know, only um, economics and then widening it out to more human development. And then what's actually really interesting, which we find in the later paper that we do, is that they start to focus more on poverty because they realize that actually measuring the economy with the HDI leaves out of too, just too many things and it's way too difficult to get everybody, you know, at the UN, all the countries in the world, to decide what should be included in an index about, you know, what is a good life. And I, I'd say good life because really that is the terminology that they're using. Um, and so then they say, well, actually, we can really agree on what poverty is. Poverty is, you know, and the, the World Bank defines it as less than $1.90 a day. Um, but they try to bring in other factors like, do you have a mud floor or a concrete floor, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's also quite interesting that the, the, the measurements actually changes um, along with critiques that are coming from from you know political activists in the 1990s were starting to say look we cannot the hdi is just as bad as the gdp we need to start um thinking more about the poor and we can't have such great um advances in the world and still have so many poor and and so um the un then is reacting to that environment and saying okay we need to focus more on this and then we go back to this as you said we go back to counting something that might not be so quantifiable but we need to count it in order for people to do something. One of the things you're also known for, Maria, is for being a very innovative teacher. You've been involved at the Teaching and Learning Center. You try all kinds of experimental things in the classroom. Your students follow you the way they would follow the Pied Piper. What is it that you do in your classroom? I know you're always trying to bring new ideas about economics to your students. You're trying to promote active learning. Maybe you could introduce us to your students and also tell us what some of your theories of pedagogy are and how you're trying to adapt um, classroom learning really to some some of these new trends in economics 
Yeah. Um, so there's two, there's two things there. Um, it's the fact that I try to make my acting, uh, my acting, <laughs> my teaching <laughs> more act, um, more active. Right. So I, I do something called acting out theory and I'm working on this. It's not still very much, um, kind of work in progress. Um, and I'll, uh, I don't know if Nikki and, and Diana, perhaps you remember doing the, uh, did we ever do the division of labor activity with you? Perhaps one of you can explain what we do in that activity. Sure. So for me, this is like one of the main things that I remember because I've taken two classes with um, Maria so far. The first one was, um, I think it was intro to macro, um, my second year, or no, my first year at AUP. And um, I remember it was, I think it was like 1030 on a Monday and you came in with a stack of papers and everyone was like, oh my God, what is she doing now? Like, it's early, let's not. And um, we were talking, we started our introduction on Adam Smith and the division of labor. And the activity was, I think we were in groups of five or something like that. And the activity was, I'm not sure if we were stapling or if we were folding, but we were doing something with the papers. And she had divided us into like one group would do it with the division of labor. So every student would have a different task. And then she had another group of students who were doing every task on their own. And of course, in the end, the group which had the division of labor, which must, was much more successful. And it was funny because in the beginning, everybody was clearly annoyed that we had to do such a almost like childlike acting out of this, of this economic concept. And by the end, everyone was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Adam Smith, division of labor. I know what that means now. So yeah, that, I remember that very clearly and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm glad to hear. I do. I also. I always notice that students are very reluctant. At first. <laughs> um, uh, and and yeah, we were doing origami. Like we were doing folding up these little. What are they called again? I always forget the word. The little papers you fold up and then you decide. You know whether you're. Oh right, yeah, I don't know what it's called, That's but origami, yeah. right? Isn't it? Fortune cookie. Oh, the thing where you open up the directions. Yes. Yeah, it's the fortune teller, exactly. Um, and it's in your class, so it worked out. Because some of my classes, it doesn't work out. And that's actually also a really good learning opportunity. Because then we can go and say, okay, so in what context does Adam Smith's division of labor work? And in what context does it not work? And that gets us on actually critiquing the concepts. Because that's also really important for me to get students to understand, okay, here are these very, very famous, and I will say it, you know, white male economists, but they can also be wrong. They're not also, they're not always right. And they're also thinking about their theories in particular contexts. And so we can go into that. Um, yeah. And so that's, oh, that's one side. And then the other side is, and both Nikki and Diana will um, have um, been, will have seen this. I teach a new textbook in my principles of, of macroeconomics, um, which was um, funded by the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which some of the listeners here might be aware of. It's a big institute um, that started after the 2008 crisis because they said, look, economics has failed us, it didn't see this crisis coming, we need new economic thinking. And, and so they funded this new textbook because they want students at the very beginning to understand that there are different ideas about the economy that we need to learn and that politics, um, power relations, um, environmental issues, inequality, all these things, racism, etc., comes into economics and it should come in at the very beginning of, um, of their economics degree. I don't know, Diana, if you want to, because you taught this, you were the TA when, for this textbook. How did you find that the students reacted to this textbook? I think that the, I didn't have the textbook when I was in Principles of Macroeconomics. Um, and I found that this textbook was a much better, it took a much better holistic look at the field. The one that I used really, you know, simplified everything down to a supply and demand curve. And so I think the students responded really well to having a verbal um, explanation of these concepts before just looking at you know, two, two curves that might seem a little arbitrary in the grand scheme of things, because in reality, we can't simplify all our variables down to one, um, one concept. So, and especially with uh, the pandemic, I think the online free textbook was extremely helpful for students going back home or staying in Paris. It, it really helped out a lot. 
Yeah, because this is the other thing about this textbook. It's not only the stuff in it that's good, it's the actual fact that it's free. Because I don't know anybody who studied economics here, you know that the textbooks are very, very expensive, which makes economics actually quite an unequal discipline. It, 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 it caters to people who are more well off. Um, and this textbook tries to take um, that away. You can buy it in paper, um, because some people, obviously we read better on paper, but um, it's much, much cheaper than the, than the other textbooks, which is also, it's, it's, it's quite revolutionary in, it, in itself. No. Yeah, I personally relied on the library copy of my macroeconomics textbook. So this would have been nice to have when, <laughs> when I was a freshman. Nikki and yeah. Diane, are either of you going on in economics? Uh, I'm actually going more in the law direction. You'll be glad to have had this background in economics though. And Nikki, what about you? Um, so my major is finance, actually my minor is economics, and I do plan on doing a master of science, a master of science in finance um, eventually. And I'm so glad that I decided to, I would have even double majored in economics looking back at it now, just because for finance, if you don't have a good holistic understanding of how economics works. I mean, it's just so beneficial to understand it on a more international and on a more global level. So it's definitely a huge part of my studies. And um, if I can even find a program that also has a kind of more built in economics part, that would be that would be ideal. Could we, could we have a question. Maybe this might be a moment when we could we could break in and ask. Um, Oh, thank you, Diana, for, for um, posting the link to the textbook that you're talking about. And um, one of the people that's on the call asked Maria, if you could please compare your quantitative measure of economic development to the Good Country Index, which she also posted, she, he or she, I'm not sure who, GG, who the person asking is, just because it's initials, but they posted a link to something called goodcountry.org. Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar. I'm just checking it out now. Okay. Um, I'm s maybe you, maybe then we could table that for a minute if you're not familiar with. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I um I imagine it's a separate institution from the UN, and we were really concentrating on on the UN, the um the World Bank, um the, the international uh, organizations. Essentially, there are a lot of institutions that that measure. Um, measure well-being, right? The OECD came out with their um, um, inequality index and so on, just trying to um, bring in other factors, but just economics, um, or sorry, it was the good life index. Yeah, so there's lots of, there's lots of um, institutions that look at um, other ways. And it, yeah, it'd be interesting. I can check that out. And Great. Maria, do you uh, ever involve your students in research that you're doing? So I have not, um, I guess I haven't uh, yet done uh, that explicitly. I, that is just, that's definitely on my kind of, you know, plan. <laughs> I would love to um, get more students involved. I do though, and this was the last thing I wanted to say about what I, how I, what I teach at AEP. I get to teach a, a economic history and history of economics course at AEP. And this was really for me getting the job at AEP. This was the huge, the biggest perk of all I got to develop my own curriculum for a course that I think is essential for all economics graduates and that has been kind of put, um, taken off the economics curriculum since the 1970s. Um, this historical perspective in economics, which I think is really fundamental. And in that course at the end, um, as well as in my development economics course, actually, I present my, something I'm working on that in that period. So um, Nikki um, got to hear about my research about an Indian economist in the 19th century who traveled all around Europe and how his travels influenced the way he saw poverty. Because these are the kinds of questions that I'm asking, right? So how do we form knowledge? How do we create knowledge? And what are the kinds of things that impact that um, knowledge um, creation? And, um, and so I, I find, I've heard this from other colleagues that it's actually really um, great to, to present your research to students because then they understand, okay, what do you do when you're not teaching? A lot of students don't even know that we have other stuff but teaching. Um, but it also in that, in the economic history, history of economics course, it's even more important because they understand why what I do that is very abstract and 
and far in the past is is quite important for today and, and how we how we see the world and how um, and how it works. So one of the things that's happening on campuses everywhere is sort of renewed attention or new attention to racial inequality and social injustice. There's not a campus in the world, I think, at this moment that's not concerned about that. Obviously, economics is a tool in coming to terms with issues like this. Um, do you want to talk about some of the ways that that's so, uh, some of the ways you may have talked to your students about it or that your own research touches on those issues? Yeah. Um definitely is very topical at the moment and thank god right we need to have more of these of these conversations i am um, so, so i mentioned that my focus is on indian economics right and these indian economists have not been given agency as economists they they are a lot of colonial studies um talk about how the british and even indians in india in the um late 19th century and then also at the beginning of the 20th century we just just assumed that indians copied existing thought copied european thought and and regurgitated it they couldn't um come up with knowledge and what's really sad to see is actually as i said indians themselves um thought of themselves as unable to create knowledge um and and so my my real my project is very political in that sense that I try to bring these Indian economists into um, conversation with other economics literature and giving and, and give them agency as economists um, and really there there are a few scholars a handful of scholars that started doing it um, started giving them agency as thinkers generally as nation, nation, nation builders political scientists um, but as economists it's it's very very rare and so that's where I um, see that I think this work, as much as it is abstract, is really, really important for this conversation. I mean, just um, just today I saw um, an article on the BBC about a new book uh, about um, one of these Indian economists and how he was an MP in the UK and how he can give us lessons about the fact that we need to have more um, people of color in, in parliament in the UK um, and how this, you know, this man in the late 19th century, how he managed to become a parliamentarian in, in an MP um, in the UK is phenomenal. Um, it, it's really quite extraordinary. And I think these stories are um, stories of hope as well as of um, saying, look, we had these issues some hundred or so years ago and we still have them. So we need to, we need to do more. Um, and then just as a, um, as a, as a personal story that, which I like to tell some, um, especially my development economics um, students, um, is this necklace that I um, wore uh, today um, for this talk. And it's a necklace from um, Mali that my um, brother was able to get for me when he was there as a UN officer. And the reason I show you this is because the, um, it has a lot of significance. So this, this circle here is, is, represents a well, and these um, points here represent churches. In a town, the northern um, desert town in Mali called Mbuka, I'm pronouncing it wrong, I do apologize. Um, and this would give you access to the well in this town. And, and, and so it would give you access as well as your herd of animals. And I, and I, I think this is really important to understand that, that Africa, as well as um, other regions of the world that we generally refer to as developing countries, you know, some 50 years ago, they were referred to as underdeveloped um, countries, right? They have a very, very rich history, um, very similar to the one that we have in Europe and America. Um, and, you know, my brother returned from Mali with stories of some 15 year, years ago or so in Mali, there were vibrant markets and, and, and much higher well-being in northern Mali, which is now, you know, ruined by, by civil war. And, and we have a part to play in that um, and and it's 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 really important to not undermine the the um these these whole you know communities um that that we brush aside and, and, and it needs to as much as um it, the needs conversation needs to happen here and i think somewhere like EP it's a real where, where students go off everywhere in the world and and we're all very privileged and have um powerful voices we, we can have we can make a real difference there so uh, I think it's time to start taking some of the questions from, from here. And I noticed that Pamela Spurden asks, could you address the question raised by the title of your talk, which is how 
economic ideas shape our lives. How do economic ideas shape our lives, Maria? Yeah, so this is, um, the reason I had this, it's obviously a very general title, but if you take my, my research topic, right, in my PhD, these Indian economists, right, they were saying, look, we need to change the way we study our economy and we need to change the models we use because they're not helping to understand the way that um, India works. And, and so that's, in that sense, it is a context, you know, some 130 years ago or so, but in their context, the economic ideas were making India poor. They had some of the worst um, famines in history. Um, they had deindustrialization. Of course, there were also political reasons for that in the sense that the, the UK was colonizing um, India and, and it, it was draining its resources, etc. But the um, Britain's legitimacy was um, helped by the fact that their economic theories like um, David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, which says that each country should produce what they're most efficient at. And at the time, it was India who was most efficient at producing raw cotton, for example, and Britain was the most efficient at producing um, textiles. So they were producing manufactured goods, India was producing raw materials. And, but the profit margins on raw material production and the profit margins on um, manufacturing um, production are of course very, very different. You earn much more money if you're industrialized than if you're um, you know, semi-industrialized or only producing raw materials. And in that sense, their economic ideas were, were shaping their um, economic development and their trajectory. And I think we can, um, you know, apply that to today too. If we think about the kinds of um, economic ideas that um, Macron has, for example, a lot of people are blaming the fact that hospitals at the moment uh, during the COVID-19 um, crisis weren't as equipped as they could have been if, you know, the, the, the medical system hadn't been crippled by austerity, right? It's not, into, it's not Macron's fault because he comes after a long line of, 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 of this kind of austerity measures, which happened all over Europe and, and the Western world after the 2008 crisis. But this has real impacts, right? Um, and and, and, and um, in, in that sense, yeah, I think economic ideas shape our lives. I think that it's a two-way process, right? Our context now with COVID-19, that's gonna change the way we see the economy as well. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing cycle hopefully virtuous and not um, vicious, and that will depend on the kinds of policymakers that we have in power, right? So that's, that's another question that um, is, is, could you maybe comment, because we are in this very unique and concentrated moment, if you will, if you could, could take a stab at predicting how COVID-19 and the experience we've had just in the last three months might change change the way, would it make economic theories act more quickly? Would it make more, add more intensity? Is there a way that you see that this last three months making a significant change in your field and the generalized study of well-being? Yeah, well, I think in general, I think you're gonna have more health economics. People are, you know, we might start to see um, health economics being accepted into the bigger, highly ranked economics journals, because that's now a topic, just like the 2008 um, crisis increased our inequalities. And then you had the famous French economist Piketty, or he became famous because of it, with a data set um, and proved that there was increasing inequality. And the only time that inequality decreased in the 20th century was thanks to the world wars that destroyed, you know, um, family wealth. So. Um, you're going to start to have um, more focus on health economics. And in that sense, we may start to see better policies with that on a very, um, you know, personal, um, yeah, on a personal level in Paris, right? I mean, anybody who bikes in Paris now has seen that there are many more bike lanes. It's much safer to bike. And that has economic impacts, right? We have, we can have better air. Um, that means that we have workers that are um, more healthy, um, et cetera, right? And so as much as that is on the local level, and it's very personally applies to me because I love biking and I think that we need to do more biking in cities, but um, that, that has, a real, has, has had a real positive impact. Now, of course, um, you asked about economic theories and how that's changed. Unfortunately, a crisis like this will obviously hurt the economy very negatively and we're gonna, start, we're gonna see the effects 
many years to come, unfortunately, with high levels of unemployment, stagnant wages, etc. Um, this is not my expertise, so this is just my kind of yeah. thinking well, generally. That but. leads nicely into a question that Jula Wilderberger posted too, which is, is there a way in which economics can help us think about an economy without growth, or at least without self-destructive growth? Yeah, that's a really good question, isn't it? And there's a lot of um, degrowthers um, is one way, it's one label that's given to them sometimes, you know, um, economists who believe that our entire way of seeing the economy is based on the assumption that we need growth. And I think as having studied the history of development ideas, that is very much the case. I mean, if the economy isn't growing, we don't see it. Um, we don't even look at that period in time. If, if a period of time in history is stagnant, we very, very few researchers even look at it. And so I, there I have to be a little bit pessimistic. I think we're very far from that. Good. Um, unfortunately. Good. So one last question from me um, to sort of go back to where we started. You've now been at AUP for well over a decade. What do you think has changed the most since you first came to AUP and now that you've come back to AUP? What's changed the most at the university? What's changed the most? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this a while since Mary asked me this a couple of weeks ago. I, um, I think the most for me has changed that we're starting to concentrate more on the research output of the professors, which I think is a very good thing for our students because the research plays into our teaching, right? And just like I mentioned earlier that I, I try to change the way we're teaching economics and this is why I, my research is so important to me. Um, and so in that sense, I think the, the professors are getting much more support and that's a real kind of um, push um, from the entire institution to um, have professors that are very engaged in, the, in their research. Um, I think that's something that's fundamentally changed. Of course, physically to AUP has just changed. I mean, every time I go to the K building, I'm like, am I really at AUP? It's just, I didn't, I, I, I loved when I was at AUP. I didn't, I didn't think of AUP as someone that was lacking resources, but, but it is true now that you go into K, you're like, yeah, maybe we were missing one or two things. You know, this is just incredible. Um, and so in that sense, it's obviously changed fundamentally. And I think any alum that walks into the K feels exactly the same way. At least that's the, my impression I get from, from my um, alumni and friends. But what, what I think is also quite extraordinary is that even though EEP has, has gotten slightly bigger um, in terms of you know, student base, slightly bigger in terms of you know, engaged um, professors and researchers and so on, you've still managed to keep this quite very, very international, small family environment. And that's what I really love and admire about AUP. And, and I think that's also one of the reasons that we want to stay small, right? This is the, this is the kind of experience that both students and professors, um, professors love. And really, I mean, a lot of people ask me, colleagues, students, you know, what is it like coming back to AUP as a professor? And I, it's, it, it, they ask it as if I'm going to say, oh, it's so different. It's not that different. Yes, it's on, it's on the, side, the side I teach, right? I still get to do what I love. I get to teach, learn, and research, which is, you know, this is what I did at AP when I was a student. So um, it's, in, in a sense, it's, it's also not changed that much either for good, for good, which is for a good reason, right? I'm glad you see it that way, because I like to think that our DNA has stayed intact, but we have made a very conscious decision to support faculty research and to hire teacher scholars because of that incredible dialectical relationship between teaching and scholarship. Scholars who stay active in their field bring that back into the classroom and there's a continual, you know, as you say, virtuous circle. And it's also had a huge impact in raising our reputation, I think, worldwide. Um, the quality of scholarship and the amount of scholarship that our faculty manages to do despite a pretty heavy teaching load. So I'm glad you've mentioned that because I think we're starting to really see the impact of years and years and years of making that decision. Investing in faculty salaries, investing in sabbaticals, faculty development money, you know, the, the uh, course releases for research, all the things that would facilitate and help faculty to be productive. That's great. Um, Mary, do you want to jump in here, hold on, and say this is a perfect um, a, a question I was going to throw in here. And Suzanne Spahn 
asks it in a different way. Maria, um, before, before we hopped on this call, you said that where you're sitting now is where you taught all spring or taught, taught since March 16th. And I just, first of all, Suzanne's question is, can you tell us a little bit about how your teaching had to change during the pandemic? And I know we don't have four more hours, but maybe you could distill that. But I also hope you'll share with us what is behind you on those walls that your students saw for the last three months? I love this story. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, well, so just before I forget these, these paintings here, and maybe we can actually see Suzanne's painting. It's somewhere there behind oh, the wall. Wow. So Suzanne... If you go to speaker view, you can really see your full screen will fill up with Maria, and you can see her necklace, and you can see these paintings behind her. But please, yes. Yeah, I think... I think one of these is to, to Suzanne Spahn asked that question, how my, my, my teaching changed. And so I, I, I taught here, it's um, Pierre's desk, my husband's desk, he works from home full time. So his, his work life didn't change much since the pandemic. And so he has a standing desk and I just couldn't imagine teaching not standing. So thank God he had this desk, right? And also I like the fact that it's right behind these paintings, which as I said, Suzanne painted one of them at our wedding. Um, one of our friends came with these, um, canvases and we spent the afternoon um, the day after a wedding painting um, and so yes yeah, so I taught, taught here and to some extent the teaching didn't change at all and some to, uh, to another extent it changed fundamentally right so the beginning when we had about two we had two days to figure everything out right all academics in the world right um, and I just thought to myself okay I had two priorities one that um, this needs to be engaging my students need to get need to get this, the, 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 the material, they need to get the taught material that they were gonna be taught anyway. But second of all, they, don't, they shouldn't get stressed and I shouldn't get stressed, right? So this was partly selfish, partly for the students, right? So I just thought, okay, so I need to change the way I'm doing this, but limit overwhelming myself and my students. And so I decided to, to cut down on, on, on teaching, you know, uh, to a big group and gave uh, my students more access to me, um, one-to-one -one, which I definitely saw that students took more advantage of that they were at home you know so they could just um, tune in and I could do it at hours that was more um, that was more convenient to them too if they were in different time zones and for um, so for one of my classes I flipped the classroom so I only did exercises in class and I've wanted to do this for years and I just never dared as a young scholar a young professor I was like I'm never gonna manage this they're gonna ask me questions I have no idea to answer and I just thought no this is the moment crisis leads to innovation, right? As all economists say, and I flipped my classroom. It was just fantastic. It was really, really great. Um, so I'd only do exercises with them in the class and then they would read and watch videos before. And with this core textbook, the textbook that I use, the graphs are interactive. As Diana said, they're all online. Um, and then in my other class, which um, I had with um, Nikki, um, I did, I, I continued with the lectures, but then I set them up in groups for them to do some group work and actually do produce, um, start to study way earlier um, and push them to write essays. And I'm, I'm glad that Nikki is now nodding her head. Maybe you could tell us how, how those, what those group activities were about and, and, and how, how you found them. Sure. So we went, I mean, the whole first part of the semester was very lecture based. And I mean, we had our midterm, but the majority of it was just listening and there was some discussion. But when the pandemic started, um, basically, we would be assigned um, various readings. And then as a group together, we would write a short paper, I think it was about a page long, um, every week, and we would cover one large economic concept. So I think we did like supply and demand, division of labor, these huge topics, and we would be assigned these readings. And it was really different because when you're preparing for a class, you know, there are times when you'll skim a reading or you'll skip a reading or something like that. But for this, it was, I don't know, I felt like I was much more engaged with the, with the material because I felt like it was kind of all I had, you know, with the flipped classroom, the reading that you do on your own is kind of much more important in that way. And then, I mean, we did do group work before, but not a ton, but speaking to these other students, which I really had not much interaction with before. Like, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Um, just doing the group work and speaking with students that I hadn't really talked to much before and hearing what they had to say. It was just a whole different experience and something that you don't have that much in university. 
Um, so I actually really enjoyed it. I feel like I actually did a lot more work and a lot more preparation than I would have in a normal setting. And like Maria already said, you were kind of constantly doing the prep for the exam, which was like an added bonus. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, because the idea was that you were, that I realized the students, I realized that the students would realize that once the exam came along, which was almost the same exact essay questions, they wouldn't have to study and their brains had also been thinking about this for much, much longer, right? And so they're gonna have much better ideas, much better understanding about the material. And as I have struggled to learn as a writer myself, right? You have to write to think. You cannot think clearly if you don't write clearly. And so, and, 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 and I'm so glad that the COVID pushed me to innovate in this way as much as I, I, I so miss the, the classroom and I'm I hope I'm keeping my fingers crossed or holding my thumbs as we do in Sweden that we get back to the physical classroom uh, but those those um, changes that I've made I'm keeping them yeah so I see another question here on the feed from Louise. Uh, Maria, thanks for this interesting talk. Could you please talk a bit about your life as a woman academic and a mother? And of course you have a toddler, uh, not even a toddler yet. So tell us. Yeah, thank you for that question. I actually, um, I run a podcast in history of economics and we did during the COVID-19, we did an interview with my, my co-host and I, with a senior scholar in our field that talks a lot about her struggles being a mother of three kids in the field um, as an academic. Um, and it was quite interesting to talk about the kinds of things you have to think about. You become more efficient with your time. Um, and so, as, as a, so first of all, let's start. As a woman, um, it is a difficult in economics. In history of economics, there are, it's a little bit more friendly because it's already a subfield. So we're already marginalized by the other economists, the applied economists. Um, so they're a little bit um, nicer, but you do get comments and history of economics is traditionally um, an old uh, man's job. I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but, but it tends to be the thing that prof economics professors do when they retire and they don't have to you know, think about tenure and so on. And so you, yeah, it is quite intimidating and you get, um, uh, you, you're, the way you look is what gets judged first rather than what you're saying. Um, and that is, I, I've struggled with that most of my, you know, academic life. It's definitely getting easier with time and building a, a group of supporters, both women and men. Um, and I have to say in my generation, the, um, the men are so supported, they don't treat you any differently. And I think that's where I'm actually quite optimistic about um, the future of, of um, fe female economists, um, but we have a lot of work to do. Huh? We talk about this at AEP. I mean, we have 70% um, uh, women at AEP, but in our economics classes, we're 50-50. I mean, why is that, you know? Um, and so that's something we, um, myself and um, Carla Canelas, another um, ec economist in, in, the, in the department, are working on actively um, to get, to get our female students to have more confidence because we often see that it's it's um to do with kind of norms about what you study when you're a woman you know the reactions i had and i'm young i know i realize this but even the reactions i had when i said i'd studied economics and applied mathematics at AEP, like oh you're not blonde <laughs> inside but you know it, it is it is odd and then so on the other part of the question as a mother um my son is um, 10 months old, so I'm, it's still very new to me. Um, but I have to say it's an amazing experience. I love the fact that it prioritizes my, my, my life. Um, you know, as a PhD, it's all, when you're doing a PhD, it's all overwhelming. Everybody boasts about the fact that they work on the weekend, and, which I hate. I, don't, I think work-life balance is a, real, is, a, is a real need and is much better for us. So I think it, it's really... Um, my son Anton really teaches me how to prioritize life differently. Um, and I would say that AEP and, and academia, if you're in a friendly environment like AEP, you can actually really um, have a very comfortable um, working life balance. And I, and I definitely have found that. We have um, had a lot of Zoom calls over the last three months with a lot of toddlers and cats coming into the screens from, from side to side and they bring the joy. Um, I love seeing Anton and other, other um, young members of the AUP community. So thank you for sharing that. 
Um, the last question, which returning um, participants to these calls will note, will recognize, is we always like to close with with something that you'd like us to be sure to take away from your call and from this meeting. And I always say, for your next Zoom cocktail party, how can we impress the other guests? But really, just what's what's one fact, either about AUP or your work or your family or whatever you want that you would like people to remember when they think back on this hour, this fascinating hour for which we're so grateful today. There's so many things. <laughs> um, no, really just next cocktail party, apero, tell people that they were Indian economists in the late 19th century that came up with a new idea of development. I bet you they won't know it. No, I didn't when you told me a couple of weeks ago. So that's a good, that's a great one. Good. Well, we really can't thank you enough, Maria and Nikki and Diana. Congratulations to Diana, who just graduated, and to Nikki, who will be graduating in December. And Maria, I, I think when you said at the beginning that that a, you, you said Ali Ramana, but the distillation as a good faculty member changes the way you see the world. And it's pretty obvious that you have been changed. We all probably have been, but now you're changing world, changing worlds for your students. So thank you so much for joining us today and for doing that every day and every Zoom day on the, in the AUP classroom now around the world. It's just a, such a pleasure to, to have you participate today.